And now I'm going to introduce Wesley Smith, who is a world-renowned ethicist and author. Previously a barrister, he now is very much in demand for speaking on life issues. I actually first thought of speaking when I saw him on YouTube, where he spoke about Peter Singer's appointment to Princeton. And I, I was just, I watched the whole thing, and I just thought, what a superb speaker. There is a man who can explain to everybody and raise great passion in us, as, uh, in us all as to why we need to defend human life, why it's, it's the path that we need to take before us to degrade ourselves by allowing the weakest and the most vulnerable in our society to be experimented on and to be disposed of. Can you please welcome Wesley Smith. You uh, made me look bad because I didn't learn how to speak Irish. <laughs> I apologize. You know, when I, when I, uh, my wife and I first landed, uh, we were met by Mark and uh, Edith, and I said, uh, I'm part Irish. And she, Edith smiled. She said, yeah, that's what all you Americans say. <laughs> and I said, that's because all Americans are part Irish. <laughs> Maybe that says something about the Irish as much as about the Americans. But I uh, really appreciate being here. Uh, having just heard you speak, Nave, uh, remind me never to get on your wrong side. <laughs> and, and please pardon my voice. Uh, coming from California, I brought a cold with me to Ireland, Sunbelt country. And uh, I do bring you greetings from California, the land of Anno. <clears throat> well, my governor can beat up your tea shot. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, somebody said, I wish he would. <laughs> I hope it's a tie. <laughs> uh, I'm here and uh, really appreciate coming and the opportunity to speak and uh, the power of uh, people deciding that they can make a difference in a free country could not be more important. And I, I think you all ought to give yourselves a round of applause for caring enough to come out on a cold night and listen to two Yanks come over and uh, try to describe things. But please give yourselves an applause. <laughs> I'd like to try to put uh, this stem cell, embryonic stem cell issue into slightly larger context because it is not, uh, and, and Maeve touched on this, but I, I don't even think she went far enough. It is not uh, something that is isolated in and of itself. It is part of a bigger picture. And this bigger picture is uh, what I call the threat to human exceptionalism. Uh, and, and the premier issue, I think, of the 21st century actually deals with this because it will set the moral tone for the rest of the century for your children, your grandchildren, and so forth. And I'd like you to ponder this question. I'd like you to, uh, after you leave here, talk to your relatives about this question, your friends, your priests, uh, your minister, your uh, teachers, uh, your colleagues at work, and so forth. Does human life have ultimate value simply and merely because it is human life? Think about that question. Do we have relevant, is, is our humanity relevant to our moral value? There are an awful lot of people, obviously Nave says, yes! <laughs> but there are an awful lot of people today, very powerful people. People uh, who have a lot of money behind them people who are adamant about changing society in a way that I think and I think you think uh, is for the worse. Who, when you ask them that question, does being human, is that in and of itself what brings moral value, they will say no. Being human is not what gives moral value. And what they're really saying when they say no to that question is that being human is morally irrelevant. That's a very dangerous place for us to be because it strikes me that unless we say yes to the question I pose, unless we say yes, being human in and of itself is what gives moral value. At least things such as the, the right to life or the right not to be used as an object, a thing, then there's no chance to sustain universal human rights, is there? Because if you say no to the question I pose, you have to ask a second question. And what's that second question? Well, then if it's not being human that gives ultimate moral value or the highest moral value, what does? 
and across a very broad array, as I said, of uh, disciplines and uh, issues, we are seeing that people are saying no to the question and coming up with different ideas as to what does get value. And realize when you say no to the question, then what does matter in terms of moral value depends on who has the power to decide. So that if you're in power and you decide that somebody else doesn't have as much value, that can lead to consequences, as it has throughout human history. And one of the things that inspired me when I was young was Martin Luther King, where we were trying to expand the inclusion of the human community, do away with racism, do away with invidious discrimination. But now as we seem to be moving towards actually achieving that goal, I mean, I have an Irish president who's part African American, Obama. <laughs> as we are trying to move toward that goal, we are turning away from human, human equality and creating new disposable casts of people, new people to be exploited and new people to be oppressed. Let me just give you a couple of quick examples. I will focus on the bioethical issues because they're most germane to the stem cell, but I want to give you just a couple of other examples so you can see that this is not an isolated problem and it's not an isolated situation. Uh, materialists, for example, uh, are now saying that being human is irrelevant in terms of moral value. And in my hometown newspaper, the San Francisco Chronicle, a Darwinian, Darwinian materialist named John Darton uh, wrote an article. And, and this is a quote from that article. He said, quote, we are all of us, dogs and barnacles, pigeons and crabgrass, the same in the eyes of nature, equally remarkable and equally dispensable. Think very carefully about that. If human beings are equally dispensable to barnacles, then we are in very big trouble. And then you move into who decides who's disposable, which gets us into the kind of utilitarianism uh, that we're seeing reflected in some of these issues, and, and that I got so mad about in uh, Peter Singer in that YouTube uh, clip. Somebody put that up because I lost my temper. They wanted me to look bad. And I, I've been getting so many compliments about it. It's, it's quite a mad. I did lose my temper. And I went off script, as they say. <laughs> but uh, so that, I mean, I think if you say that we're no more remarkable than, and, and we are as dispensable as barnacles, you can see that that can lead to some very, very, very bad places. And there were some MPs over in the UK that want to lift the ban on reproductive cloning. So even though this is still a very new field, there are already plans to move to that agenda. There's a group called the Transhumanists. Have you heard of the Transhumanists? If you have a computer at home, go to Google or Yahoo, type in Transhumanists, T-R-A-N-S-H-U-M-A-N-I-S-D. So it's humanist, but before it, transhumanist. They literally want to create a post-human species using the biotechnology that would be created through cloning, and some of the other techniques in terms of cyber technology, nanotechnology, and so forth. It is a new eugenics. It is a new, literally, a new Superman philosophy. And it is coming out of Cambridge, Yale, Harvard, the high universities. And there's a lot of money being poured into this philosophy. And it is a new eugenics because the whole concept is to create people with specialized and hyper uh, capacities. And by very definition, since you're going to say that people with special and hyper capacities, greater intelligence is usually what they, they focus on. By definition, that violates human exceptionalism because you're saying that just being a human being isn't enough. You have to have more than that. And that becomes dangerous. And in fact, as part of the transhumanist manifesto or the belief system, they want to do away with what is called human racism. That is the idea that human beings have unique moral value. And where this is most immediately a problem is in bioethics. What is the pretext or the premise or the rationalization for using human embryos and embryonic stem cell research, for destroying them in embryonic stem cell research, or doing human cloning? The idea is that these embryos are not what they call persons. Now, it used to be that being a person and being a human being was synonymous. That's not true anymore, at least in the high bioethical thinking. 
at the universities and in the mainstream view. And a lot of these people are now in hospital ethics committees and are teaching the doctors of tomorrow. Peter Singer, uh, Dave mentioned, is, has the most prestigious bioethics chair in the world at Princeton University. And he is a prime proponent of this person of theory I'm about to describe. They answer no to the question I posed. And they say that what matters is being a person. Embryos can be destroyed because they're not persons. It is irrelevant to moral morality, they say, because an embryo doesn't have a brain. It's true, at least in the early embryo. It doesn't have a nervous system. That's true, at least in the early embryo. But particularly that it doesn't have certain cognitive capacities. For example, being self-aware over time. That's Peter Singer's view. If an entity is not self-aware over time, then that entity or that individual is not a person. And I say entity or individual because in person in theory, some animals are persons. And some people are not persons. Because the value of life, it's called the quality of life ethic, depends on your cognitive capacity. So that if an animal has higher uh, capacities than a human, that animal will have higher moral value than a human. And this is coming from people who are very influential. It is certainly not the view of the general public. But when you get into that academy, you get among the intelligentsia, you get among the big brain folk, you come up with some very bad ideas.